make a start this morning as we sing a few choruses and as we commence our worship together. Our first chorus this morning, worship majesty, worship his majesty, unto Jesus be glory, honor, and praise. That's a good start. Our second one this morning, there is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. him reminds us we're going on to a better place. There's coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye.
Let's sing our final one before the opening hymn, O oh, safe to the rock that is higher than I, my soul in its conflicts and sorrows would fly. Maybe this morning you're sitting here, you're down discouraged, you're troubled in some way. Well, just think about these words as you sing them this morning. O oh, safe to the rock that is higher than I. together and sing this, our opening hymn, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Let's sing this out to God's praise after our introduction. Oh, yeah. 
Now open your Bible at John, John's Gospel, please, chapter 1. And James Bowman's going to come and read to us John 1, verse 1 to 13. Thank you, James. This reading is taken from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 13. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John, the same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was sent not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many received him, to them give he to, the, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Thank you so much, James. As we said, as a church, we're going to read through John's Gospel, and we're going to have a portion every week if possible, except maybe visitors here or whatever, and I want you to think about these words because these are so important. John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That's your homework now for next week. I want you to learn those two verses. I'm not going to ask you to come up and read them or anything like that, but you know it's good to hide Scripture within our hearts. So there's two verses that are well worth uh, learning for yourself. Verses 1 and 2 of John chapter 1. Let's bow together in prayer. Let's commend ourselves to the Lord as we meet together this morning. Our God and our Father, we thank you so much for the great privilege extended to each of us today that we're able to come and meet together in this building we're able to come to worship the Lord, and we're able, our Father, to listen to the public reading of your word. In many parts of our world today, believers would not have that privilege either to read your word or to hear your word preached. And therefore, our Father, we don't take these things for granted. We thank you for your word because this is the living Word of God, and we pray that we might always seek to read it, to learn it, and to apply it to our lives by the help of the Holy Spirit, so, our Father, that we might become everything that we ought to be in this world in which we live. We come to you this morning, and we lift our hearts in praise, in worship, in adoration to you. You are the great God who sits enthroned upon the very universe that you have created. You are the one who sustains all things by the word of your power. You are a thrice holy God. And we come to you, our Father, realizing that we have no right to come into your presence resting on any merits of our own. We thank you that you sent your Son the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to be our Savior. Father, we thank you that he was willing to come from the heights of glory and come and live in this world. He lived a perfect life. And our Father, they took him, arrested him, and they nailed him to an old rugged cross. But we are reminded in your word, our Father, that this was part of the great plan and purpose of God for the saving of a people unto himself. We want to thank you for the place called Calvary today. We want to thank you, Father, for ever sending your Son to be our Savior. We want to thank you that so many of us 
know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have been the recipients of your grace. And we rejoice in salvation blessing. And it is our earnest prayer, our Father, that each one who enters through these doors, young and old alike, might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Thank you, Father, for your kindness and your goodness to us in another week that has slipped out into eternity. Thank you for watching over us and for meeting us at the point of our need. Thank you, Father, for being with those who have been in hospital throughout this past week. We thank you that they're all home again, and we bless you for answering our prayers for them. And we ask that you would just continue to keep your hand upon them and raise them back again to a full measure of health and strength. We think of all our elderly members who are shut in in their own homes or today are in residential care. And we do pray that God's blessing would be upon each one of them wherever they are and whatever they're doing. We pray, Father, that you will bless your word that has gone forth to the boys and girls in Sunday school and in the Bible class. And we ask our Father that you would continue to lead our young people and our children. And Father, as they make their way through this difficult life, we just ask that they might know God's hand upon them and God's blessing upon them too. Father, do remember we ask everywhere where your word will be preached this day. We Pray, Father, that you will bless every servant of the cross. We pray that every church in this town will know a sense of God's presence with them. We pray, our Father, for this land of ours with all its great need. We look at it spiritually and we think about it economically and, Father, sadly, politically. We realize that we are in such a great need and we know that you alone can meet that need today. So we commend all of these things to you and we pray that God would undertake for our land at this time. Father, we remember today all those who will listen in with us live on Facebook. We thank you for them. We thank you for their presence with us. We thank you for their encouragements. And we pray for each one of them, wherever they're listening in just now, that they'll feel part of us and that God will bless them too. Father, these are our prayers as we come to you quietly. We realize, our Father, that we have sinned against you in this week that is gone. We know, our Father, that we have sinned in thought, word, and in deed. So please, cleanse us afresh, we ask, from all our sin, and help us today to live lives of holiness, and help us, our Father, wherever we are, to realize that we are the Lord's people and we live according to a different standard from the world in which we live. So hear our prayers and bless us now, we ask, as we come to you in the Savior's precious and worthy name. Amen. Amen. Now, Mark's not with us today, so please bear with me as I make the necessary announcements and then Alicia's going to come and speak with the boys and girls. You're all very welcome as you gather with us here in the building and those who are visiting. We thank you so much for being one of our number and we trust that God will bless you as you meet with us today. For all those listening on live on Facebook, again, you're very welcome and trust that God will bless you. Now, after the ministry of God's word, we meet around the Lord's table to remember the Lord Jesus Christ as he has commanded us to do. And if you're saved, walking in fellowship with the Lord, please wait as we break bread together. Johnny, Jenny Finney, our children's church, Caroline, Serena Fairburn, and Jasmine Carson are on Christ duty today. We meet again tonight for prayer at a quarter to six. Our gospel meeting is at half past six. The singers will be Brooke Quartet, and I will be preaching, God willing. There will be a praise group practice after the gospel meeting tonight, and then youth fellowship will take place from 8 o'clock through to 9.15. Tonight there will be pizza and a table quiz. 
Tomorrow night, Monday night, our discipleship explored class continues. That's at 7.45, and the subject we'll be considering tomorrow night is obedient in Christ. Tuesday, 10.30, parents and toddlers. 6.45, the Good News Club. Then 8 p.m. will be the monthly ladies' meeting. The speaker on Tuesday night is Heather Saunders from Wycliffe Bible Translators, and all uh, ladies are very welcome to that meeting. Wednesday, 8 o'clock, Bible study and prayer meeting. We're exploring Ephesians. I'll be speaking, and you're welcome to join with us on that occasion. Friday, 12.15, that's the Friday Bible study, the sevens of the Gospel of John, and Woody Price will be taking that meeting. The youth club will be on on Friday night, running from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. Now, next Lord's Day, the 12th of March, commencing at 10 a.m. with Sunday school and Bible class, 11.30 will be our morning service and the breaking of bread. Ivan McCrum will be speaking to the children Don Atchison, Claire McKelvey will be in Children's Church next week. Diane Maidley, Yvonne McCrum, Kristen Guinness, and Aaron Bell will be on Christ duty. Then 5.45, our prayer meeting, preceding our gospel meeting at half past six. And I again will be preaching at both services. Gordon Quinn will be preaching or will be singing, God willing, next Sunday night. Eight o'clock then, the Youth Fellowship. Uh, Saturday, 24th of March at Belmont Hotel, there will be a men's breakfast from 9.30 through to about 11.30. Now, all men are welcome, and please give your name to Colin Buchanan if you intend to come and join us on that morning. So please do any queries at all. Ask Colin about that, but please plan to attend if you can. One further announcement these pair of glasses have been found at the uh, pathway to the side of the church. I'm not sure what side, but you'll know if they're yours. Stephen says that side. So please, if these are your glasses, I'm leaving them up here. You can come and lift them. And if they're not, then they'll go along with all the other stuff that has been found and never claimed yet. But if they are yours, please do uh, take them with you. These are all the announcements, the main subject to the sovereign will of God. And Alicia is going to come speak with the boys and girls. Okay, everybody, welcome, welcome. I hope you have your Bibles today. If you do, that's good. If you don't, that's okay. If you want to run and get it. There we go. <coughs> That's okay, Ellie, if you want to go get yours. Okay, now, while we're getting sorted here, I want everyone to close their eyes, including the church and the people at home and all the children. Everyone close your eyes. Okay, keep them closed until I tell you to open them. Okay, open your eyes. <laughs> I, I believe you can see that I'm not here anymore, but you can still hear me, so do you think I'm still here? <laughs> if you think I'm still here, shout yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I was just hiding on the steps. <laughs> now, that was a little demonstration, a simple and little demonstration of Romans chapter 10 verse 17. So, if you get your Bible and open up to Romans chapter 10, Romans is the New Testament, it's um, not too far in, I'll give you a second to do that. While you're doing that, I'll explain what that was all about. Actually, maybe I'll read it first. So, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It says, have you got it okay? Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It says, so then faith cometh by, cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So I went off and hid 
but you could still hear me and you said that you believe that I was still here. And that is what our verse is talking about today. God wants us to believe in him, but it's very, very difficult to believe in something that you can't see and you can't hear, but God lets us hear him. And I was, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about a list of people in the Bible that God spoke to. And this starts off in the start of the Bible in Genesis with Adam and Eve. God spoke to them in the garden. Then it went to Noah. God spoke to him. He built a boat. And then it continues on to Samuel, who was young like some of you. God spoke to him and used him greatly. God spoke to David. God spoke to Jonah. He spoke to Mary. He spoke to Paul. And he spoke to many other people in the Bible. And you know all of those people believed in God. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to believe in him, but he wants us to hear him. Now, how do we hear God? How do we hear God? Can anyone tell me? Yes, Esther. Yes, we have to listen out to him. And how does he speak to us? Yeah. Through the Bible, Bible, yeah. And where can we hear the Bible being read and taught? Yeah. Yeah, so we hear from the Bible and we hear the Bible being read in church and we read our Bibles during quiet time and also Sunday school and Good News Club, all of those different places. That's where we can go and hear the word of God. Now, when I was putting this um, together, I was thinking about the game Marco Polo. Has anyone ever played it? We have one person, two people maybe. I'll explain it for anyone who doesn't know. So it's a water game. If you go to the swimming pool, you can play it with your friends. There's one person who is Marco, and they're blindfolded. And then all your friends, they are Polo. So Marco shouts out Polo, and they have to try and find the friends. And if you get caught, then you become Marco. Okay, so it might sound a bit confusing, but it reminded me of the Christian life. We are like Marco. We are blindfolded, trying to go through life, and we can't see anything. And that happens, when, whenever that happens, sometimes we can get lost, sometimes we can go down the wrong path, and we don't want to do that. But what, do we, what can we do? What does Marco have to do? Yeah. Yeah, Marco has to shout out Polo and listen in here. And that's when that reminded me that God was like the person who is Polo. So if we are getting lost and we're going down the wrong path, all we have to do is call out to God and try and hear him. And then whenever we do hear God, we can follow him and we don't get lost. We are found and we go down the right path. Now, whenever you play the game, the people who are polo are trying not to get caught. They're trying to run away. But God isn't like that. God takes us by the hand, and he wants to lead us, and he wants to guide us. Um, And it says in Matthew um, chapter 7, verse 7, Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And in the middle of that verse there, it says, seek and ye shall find. God wants us to look for him. Um, Has anyone ever gone to the shop or the park with your parents or grown up? Yeah. Usually you walk with them, sometimes holding their hand, especially in the shop. And sometimes you let go of their hand because you might see the toy aisle. So you run down the toy aisle and then you get lost. Now, what do you do if you get lost? Well, you can pray. You can say we pray to help you find your parents, yeah? Yeah, so you might shout out, um, you might shout at that, and you might shout out your parents, or your grown-up, and you might say, I'm lost, help me, come find me. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to call out to him. Um, so just remember, even though you can't see God, you can still hear him. But to hear him, you have to call out to him. And, to, and you also need to listen. And how do we listen? Where do we hear 
What's the tool that God has given us? Yes, Sally. The Bible. Okay. Thank you so much for listening. You guys, we're actually, everyone's going to sing. Um, my God is so big. So if everyone wants to stand whenever the music starts. The boys and girls could leave us for Christ and for Children's Church, thanks to Alicia this morning. Let's just take a moment quietly and pray together as we come to read God's Word. We've been reminded this is how God speaks to us. So let's just read. Before we read, let's pray. Father, thank you that you do speak to us through your Word. Forgive us when we neglect your word. Forgive us when we don't read it as often as we should. Forgive us, our Father, when we don't apply it the way we should. Forgive us when we don't share it with others the way we should. Your word is such an important book. It's the living word of the living God. And we are so thankful that we have it in our own possession. May it be a book that our children and young people will build their lives upon in all the days that you spare them to journey through this life. Father, we come to your word just now to read it together, to meditate upon it, and we ask simply for the help of God, the Holy Spirit, so that we might hear aright, preach aright, and apply aright the truth of your word. Hear us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me, please, for our reading today. We're going back again to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read just the first seven verses this morning, and then we'll follow on at verse 8 when we come to the uh, role of the deacon. But let's read in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through to 7. Paul writes, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. 
Amen. God will bless this reading of his word to our hearts. Is the local church still relevant in today's world? That's the question we've been asking ourselves now really for quite a while. And we went through, you may remember, the objectives of the local church. And then I said to you, we're going to come to the last few studies together in this particular subject. I said that there were two officers in the church, elders and deacons. We're going to look at both of them. I said also there were two ordinances in the church, that of believers' baptism and, of course, the Lord's table. And then what is your part and mine in his church? If all of these things we're thinking about over the weeks are vitally important and they are there biblically written for our good, then we're going to conclude by thinking about that. What is my part as a believer in Jesus Christ and his church not just locally here in Banbridge, but what part do we play in the overall work of God who works from an eternal perspective and is working all across our world today, even as we meet together? We began last week to look at the role of the church elder. And of course, that's a very, very important subject, isn't it? Some here are elders, and therefore they need to know what their role is. And I, of course, am one of them. Others who are members of this church and friends of the church, they need to know not only what elders are, but what is expected of you in response to their leadership. We began last week with this, the elder and his God-given role. We note that in the New Testament that there are three different words or terms that are used interchangeably to speak about eldership or leadership. There's the term elder, there's the term overseer, and there's the term pastor. Now, these all appear in different ways in different places in the New Testament. But remember this, that these terms are used interchangeably, and of course they indicate various features of the same ministry, but they only refer to the one office. When we looked at the role of the church elder and his God-given role, we reminded us that an elder fathers his children. Paul says, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So everything that a father is to his family, an elder ought to be to the family of God. He cares for them passionately. He looks after them individually. He protects them continually. He provides for their needs. He encourages them, and at times he chastens them whenever that is necessary. The second thing is that an elder shepherds his sheep. 1 Peter 5 says this, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God. In other words, then, the elders must be a people who feed the people and care for the people under their care. And elders must lead their people. They must not drive them. They must seek to protect them from danger. They must strengthen the weak, heal the brokenhearted, get alongside the bruised and the badly beaten. And there are so many other things that we could mention, but those things are important. I know from an elder's point of view, trying to deal with those issues can be painful, And sometimes they are very time-consuming, but they are important to the role of the elder. And the third thing, an elder rules in the church. Now, that rule doesn't come across in a very dogmatic fashion, almost as if I exercise my authority. You're the people under my charge. It's nothing like that. This is an eldership rule that is 
reaching out to people in a firm, loving fashion, concerned about your people, loving them, ministering to them with great tenderness of heart, realizing that one day you will account for their souls. And those, of course, who say, well, I'll not obey the elders. I don't have to listen to them. Well, the fact is that they are sent by God to rule and to look after your spiritual care. And you know, the church would be a much better place today if the people who are elders did their roles and those who are not submit to their leadership. That includes me, of course, too. The elder in his God-given role. Here's the second thing this morning. The elder in his God-given responsibility. Now, I want to mention these two things simply in passing because I feel that they are very important. Going back a number of years ago, you probably wouldn't even have thought about these things. We wouldn't have probably mentioned them, but today they're of the utmost importance in our ever-changing world. The first is this. It is the elder's responsibility for the protection of the pulpit. The under shepherds must make sure that the pulpit is protected and that the sheep are not led astray. Whenever Paul called the Ephesian elders together, before he would leave them for the last time, and we thought about those verses last week just for a moment or two. But before Paul learned them, do you remember he called all the elders of the church together at Miletus? And he began to speak to them, and he encouraged them, and he warned them what would happen whenever he would be gone. He said to them, guard the flock, because the wolves are coming. Guard the flock, because the wolves are coming. Now, of course, Paul was speaking in the context of those verses about false teachers who would infiltrate the church, who would lead God's people astray, who would do everything they could to divide God's people and to destroy the testimony of a local church in any community. Now, you need to be ready when the wolves come. And it's up to the elders of the church to realize it is their responsibility. And in the local church, a godly, biblically saturated leadership will just not let this happen. That means they must be alert to what is being taught in the church, not just from the pulpit, but from every department of the church. And in particular, when others are invited in to bring the word of God. It's the elders' responsibility to make sure nothing that is taught is contrary to the word of God. And that means also from inside the church and those who come in from without. Those who fill the pulpit must be men of God true to the fundamentals of our faith, men of discernment who know their Bibles, and they must be men able to protect people from error, and there's much of it in our day and in our generation. Now, elders, that's our rule. We may not like it. It may sometimes bring us into conflict both with preachers and people, but that's our responsibility to guard the flock of God over which he hath made us overseers. Too often today, people come to churches on the recommendation of others. And you know, with all the diversity that exists in church life, that can be dangerous. I'm not saying it doesn't happen or it shouldn't happen. I'm saying that the elders should take heed to these things and there comes a time perhaps when they need to vet those who come to minister the word of God. Paul says to the Ephesian elders, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers 
to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, if the Lord Jesus Christ has purchased his church, it's our responsibility and leadership of every single department to make sure that we protect it. It's the elders' responsibility for the protection of the poor. But here's the second thing. It's the elders' responsibility for the protection of the pew. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? Simply this, that it's not only the elders' responsibility to protect the pulpit, but it's essential to maintain purity and peace in the pew. You say to me, Pastor, that's a terrible thing to say. Are are you saying that there are some of us sitting here every Sunday who shouldn't be here, who are not living it right? No, that's not what I'm saying. Take your mind back for a moment to Acts chapter 5. God's adding to the church daily those who should be saved. The name of Christ, the risen Lord, is being glorified. They're being saved not in their twos and threes or tens or twenties. Sometimes they're being saved in their thousands. The church is a witness to the outside world. And then you come to all that's happening beforehand and step forward Ananias and Sapphira. And Ananias lied. He was struck down. Sapphira comes in after him, same thing. Do you say to me today, Pastor, that's a very harsh thing. But you must remember going back to those days that God did everything to maintain purity within the church. That includes me. That includes me. Perhaps more so than anybody else. If I come out to you unprepared, living an ungodly life in places where I should never be, watching what I should never see, doing things that I should never do, what good will that be for your soul? None. There's no point in the pastor telling his people how God wants them to live if he himself is not living as God demands of him. Does that mean your pastor's perfect? No. Does that mean your elders are perfect? No. But it means they have an awesome responsibility before they lead others to be enjoying unbroken, intimate fellowship with God. When they do that, they're in a position where It's necessary sometimes to maintain purity and peace in the pew. The elders look out for trouble. You say, Pastor, sure, you never get a church where there's trouble. Is that true? Maybe I've been doing this too long. But the point is this. Sometimes there is trouble in a local church. And for elders who see it not to deal with it, that's like washing your hands of the issue. That's like being Pontius Pilate whenever they brought the Lord Jesus and he knew this man has done nothing amiss. But he handed them over to be crucified nevertheless. Can't do that. Your all demands that you have courage and honesty and integrity. Sometimes you have to counsel and sometimes you have to discipline. That's the elders' role. They don't only guard their pulpit, but they have to maintain purity and peace in the pew. The elder in his God-given role, the elder in his God-given responsibility. Here's the third thing, and I'm going to go through this with just a few sentences in every convent. The third thing is the elder in his God-given requirements. If I asked you this morning, 
If you were looking for an elder for the church to join the current elders, who would you look for? What would you look for? What would you just simply say, as many people do, oh, you know, that's a good fella. And he probably is. But does he have the requirements for the job or the calling of God in this role? You can read those list of requirements, Titus 1 here and 1 Timothy 3, and they will tell you the qualities that we're looking for in an elder. You applied for a secular job today. And you went along and you sent in your application form. You answered all their list of requirements, describing the nature of the job, all that they're looking for. And they turned around and they said to you, thank you, that's absolutely brilliant. And they give you the job. And you go to the job the first morning and you haven't got a clue and you told them you're doing it this last 20 years. It doesn't work like that. Now, eldership is not a job, it's a calling. Men are set apart from the congregation by God's people. But what are they set apart for? Well, we've thought about that. What kind of people should they be? Well, Paul tells us here, in 1 Timothy 3. Let's note them very quickly in the time that remains. I'll not be too long, promise. Number one, firstly, the elder must be blameless. Blameless. That's a great word. One thing it doesn't mean is this, that the elder must be perfect. It means that the elder must be living in such a way that no charge can be brought against him, either from within the church or from without in the community. The idea here is that there are no grounds whereby this man can be apprehended as a criminal. That's the grounds behind what Paul writes here. What he simply means is there's a place where there must be no charge made against a man from within or from without the church. He's not perfect, no. But his life must be sincere and honest before all men. He must have a good and godly character. There must be nothing seen in his life that hinders him from executing his duties. Firstly, the elder must be blameless. Secondly, the elder must be the husband of one wife. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about this. What that literally means is he must be a one-woman man. A one-woman man. Now, in Paul's day, we know because we see it in letters that he penned and problems that he dealt with that polygamy and adultery were rife. And Paul is saying that the elder must be different from others. His lifestyle must be different from the standards of the world. He's a one-woman man. Doesn't Paul deal with this whenever he speaks about marriage in Ephesians 5? Sometimes we forget when he describes all the things that he does and compares, you know, this Christ and the church Sometimes we forget the background from which Paul was writing to those Ephesian believers. From a Gentile world, from a Roman world, marriage mattered nothing, absolutely nothing. A Jew could have simply got rid of his wife and divorced her for burning the toast, although I doubt they had toast in those days. But you know what I mean. It mattered nothing. Well, Paul says, listen, if you're going to be an elder in the church, you must be a one-woman man. You must live in such a way that nobody, bar nobody, can question his purity of life. He must make sure that no one can question his faithfulness to his wife. That is, if he's married. 
Now, people disagree on this. Personally, I don't put, think that Paul's demanding here that every elder must be married. He's assuming that they are, but I don't believe they need to be. But what he is saying is that every elder must have a good, sanctified conduct, single-minded in his devotions toward his wife. You see, if the elder is not married, He shouldn't be a flirtatious man. You know what I mean about that. In my day, it was called a woman's man. He should conduct himself carefully with purity in all his associations with the opposite sex. So to my mind, the issue is not here the elder's marital status. The issue is his moral and sexual purity. Thirdly, the elder must be vigilant, sober, out of good behavior. That follows on naturally, of course, because the elder must be temperate, orderly, and sober. It doesn't mean that he has to be dreary. It doesn't mean that he has to run around the church with a face like a wet blanket, letting people know how spiritual he seems to be. It's not about that. It's not about the outside, it's about the inside. He's to be well balanced. He's to be alert. He's not to be easily swayed by opinion. He's to be self-controlled, reasonable, able to keep his head when everybody else is losing theirs, forceful and yet gracious, and have a dignity of life that speaks well of his office. Many of you will know years ago, before I was ever saved, the love of my life was by bands. Three nights a week, I I was out at the band. I went anywhere and did all over the world. I loved it. It was my life. But you know, when I played in the pipe band in those days in contests, my brother, who also left because he became a Christian, would have been going into the arena to perform after practicing for months. And just as we stopped on the line before we moved forward to play, my brother would look across and he would just say, Right, men, rid of all nerves, be cool, calm, and calculated. Never forgot that. See, that's what elders need to be, whatever the circumstances have to be faced. They need to be cool and calm, calculated. And that's not always easy. For sometimes there are many difficult situations to have to deal with. Fourthly, the elder must be given to hospitality. In other words, he must be ready at all times to befriend the needy. Willing to put himself out for others, have a kindly disposition toward others, his heart and home open to others. We may need counseling, help, support. Now, I personally believe that every Christian, every single Christian should display that kind of attitude. But it must be true of the elder. And the elder must not be cliquish. He has to treat all the people the same. Now, I know in every church, whether we like it or not, cliques develop. That's reality. They're there. They'll always be there. But elders must not be part of them. If you and I want to know if you and I are breeding that kind of environment in this church, then ask yourself the question, when was the last time I went outside my circle of friends to befriend somebody else? That's a great challenge. The elder must treat all his people the same and not lean towards certain people in the church. Fifthly, the elder must be apt to teach. There's some discussion about that too. Elders should be men of the word, able to teach and exhort others. That doesn't necessarily mean from a pulpit ministry in every case. 
But elders should know the Word of God well. They should be able to counsel in a one-to-one situation. They should have a good, sound knowledge of the Scriptures and able to apply the Scriptures to those they care for. And they should have a good understanding of the Gospel so that one-to-one they're able to sit down and talk to people about Jesus. Sometimes we talk about the Word of God, and we should. But you see, for every day living, for every Christian, there is no book as important as this one. It permeates every area of life. Sixthly, the elder must not be given to wine. Like polygamy, polygamy, the drinking of wine was a very accepted practice in Paul's day. Now, whether you agree with me or not, It seems to be a very accepted practice amongst Christians today, too, who don't even stop at wine, who will drink other things. Now, I'm not going to argue with you from this text about total abstention, but I would say this. Look at what alcohol has done to our nation, to our town, to many of our families. Do you think as a Christian it's the right thing to do to be engaged in a practice like this half-heartedly? Paul says, listen, you're an elder. Have a lifestyle that's radically different from the world. By his lifestyle, he should set a good example to others. Seventhly, the elder must not be a striker or a brawler. I've been doing this a long time. I've never seen two men fighting yet in church. But here's the thing. Paul says, look, as an elder, don't be hot-headed and quick-tempered. Don't react angrily. Be gracious and polite. Be gentle. At all times, display Christ-likeness. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, but committed himself. To him that judgeth righteously. Sometimes that's hard. Not to react whenever you've been provoked, misunderstood, misrepresented. Now my wife will tell you this even if I wouldn't, so I'm going to tell you anyway. I remember as a young man in ministry in my first church, I remember many a time when I was any less than caring and compassionate in some situations. And many a time I'd have come home and hung my coat up and then a phone call came and I took it off the hanger and Christian said to me, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to sort this out tonight. Christian would say to me, put your coat away. Leave it to the morning. You'll see it differently then. Do you know the number of things I seen differently in the morning? Many of them, if not all of them. You hope that as you grow in grace, that you're not as hot-headed and quick-tempered as you used to be. As the years pass, you display a greater Christ-likeness and a greater heart for people. You say to me, well, Pastor, what happens when you're blamed and they're wrong and you're bullied by people? That also happens in church. What happens then? What do I do? I would say this, leave the people with God. Just leave them with God. You know why? It's far better for you and me to maintain our testimony and our integrity, and you may never change it anyway, so just leave it with. Eighthly, the elder must not be greedy or filthy looker. It means covetous. The elder who's paid like a pastor, he must not have a love for money. He doesn't do what he does for money. He's not swayed by those who have money. His life must be marked with satisfaction. Ninthly, the elder must rule his house well. In the first century, of course, that meant that the house, the family, there was a household much bigger than we have today. They had servants employed by the family. What Paul's saying is the elder must 
be the head of a well-managed home. Tenthly, he must not be a novice. He must have sufficient ability for the role he's doing, not due to the faith, lest he become big for his boots, not thrown in at the deep end because the church simply needs a new elder. Elders or deacons, Paul says, let them prove themselves first. Now let's on the other hand say this. To be an elder doesn't mean you have to wait till you're that elderly, you're getting the pension or you're feet ready for home. If a young man has the qualities and the spiritual qualification and he meets the requirements for eldership, then trust him. If God's word does, then you and I have to trust him. And don't wait till a man's done before we give him responsibility. Eleventhly, the elder must have a good report. What does that mean? He must care for his people and be with his people and live amongst them in such a way he's respected in the church. And live out in his community that he's respected in the community. Or to put it an Ulster way, He must be consistent in his home, in the church, and in his workplace. Because he's a different breed of man. People may not always agree with him, but they'll know by a standard of life there's something different about him that sets him apart from others. The role of the church elder What an important role it is in the life of the local church. Those of us who are elders, we must honestly face up to the challenge of what we do. And enabled by God, fulfill our God-given responsibilities. Those who would desire the office of an elder, make sure you think seriously about all that is entailed and desire it for the right reasons. And those of us in this church, I say this honestly, you should be praying for the elders daily in every meeting for the awesome responsibility that they have under God. One day, they will account for your soul. Let's bow together for prayer. Father, we recognize there's so much involved and we could take so much more time on this subject, but we've tried to generally give an overview of all that eldership means and what's required of those who are elders. Father, we just pray that you would help us often to read these verses, that you would apply them to our hearts, and that we might apply them into the way in which we deal with people every single day, both in the church and outside the church. Just help us to be, we pray, the people of God that we all desire to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn together. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay.
Father, that's what we pray for in every aspect of our lives as believers today. Fill with thy spirit, Lord, until people see nothing but the beauty and the loveliness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us, we pray, each time we come to your word that this is your word. We are your people. Help us to grow in grace and our knowledge of Christ. Help us to be the people we need to be, for we know that so often we fall short of what you expect us to be. Forgive me. Forgive us, we pray, and make us what we ought to be. For those who leave us now, we pray that you'll take them home safely. For those of us who wait around the Lord's table, bless that time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.